blueprints to be a structural system. Tonight we're going to start focusing on the wooden post greenhouse. And our guests tonight are two people who were uh, very prolific in their practice and influential through their practice and their teaching at USC. Our first speaker will be Cal Straub, and our second speaker will be Don Hensman, who um, formed a partnership and practiced together with Conrad Buff until 1961. And uh, so there's a whole body of wonderful work that we'll be looking at with Cal Straub and then the continuation of the firm uh, here after how uh, Straub went to, uh, pr uh, to teach uh, at uh, ASU in Phoenix and Tempe. So uh, the partnership was dissolved at that time, and uh, he continued to teach and practice in Arizona. And Don Hemsman and Conrad Love continued to practice here. So it's a very interesting kind of uh, uh, story, I think, for us to be tuning into tonight wonderful body of work. Uh, I want to give you just a little bit uh, of, of background. They really, in their work, um, and I have to kind of introduce them this way because it all overlaps, you know. Um, the language of the uh, structural system of the wooden post and wooden house uh, was expressed through the evolving work of this firm. And um, the teaching, uh, Cal Straub taught at USC from 1946 to 1961. And uh, Don Hensman and, and Conrad Boff also taught after, upon graduation from USC. And uh, the whole generation young architects were influenced by, by these men. Cal Strong uh, was from Pasadena, was born in Pasadena, I believe, and uh, started some of his education there, and then went uh, to Texas A&M and worked with an architect who was quite well known, William Caudill, and learned about things like function and user's needs and contemporary design methodology uh, instead of uh, the form and facade which was part of the Beaux-Arts uh, formal system. Uh, that was just beginning to break down around the early 40s. And he came back to USC uh, after his uh, Navy training and service and uh, began to teach and helped um, modernize the approach to design and teaching in terms of attitude. And um, tonight we'll be seeing, um, uh, I hope, all of that work, the early work especially, that began in the 50s. He started, uh, his first house was in 1951, and he practiced till 1955 alone when the partnership was formed. So there are a lot of wonderful images from both people that we'll be seeing tonight, and we'll be starting with Calvin Straw, who's come from Scottsdale, Arizona, to be with us tonight. Cal? Yeah. Thank you, Shelley. If I stagger down the aisle, then I've just come from the most wonderful meal. The wine was superb, Ray poured with a generous heart, and the salmon was great when we got out of the pot. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was a lovely meal. <laughs> it 
And, and besides being a lovely meal, I've had a lovely couple of days. I got in yesterday afternoon, so they picked me up at LAX Chaos, and I've been up visiting one of my daughters who lives in north of San Francisco. We we're looking for a new site for a house, and I climbed over every hill and dale in that area, and I exhausted by that time. But uh, we had a good talk to last night, and again, nice things to eat and talk about, and good people. But also, it's I want to mention about Don. This is a thing which we used to try to tell people that is very hard to explain. Uh, when I came back to teach, and I didn't come back to teach, I fluked out. I came to visit the school that I had tried to destroy before the war. <laughs> we used to hang all the faculty in Effigy, and particularly the dean. And when we got back, fortunately there was a new dean and new faculty, and it was jolly fun. And happily, I had to stop by to visit. And, uh, duty and offered me a job. And I was three years in the Navy and had never done anything. I'm scared to death. And I said, I don't know anything, sir. And he says, good, that qualifies you for being a teacher. <laughs> and uh, off we went and we had a grand time. But many of the people at that time were really the same age I was. And we had all gotten out sort of through the war, before the war. And uh, come back and Conrad and Don were students of mine, which sounds like they were much younger, but they really weren't. Yes, we were just a year. <laughs> I should warn you that he sold his soul to the devil. He stayed professionally young, of course. And uh, I've always given that gift. But we used to have a great time, and we had a, a firm that uh, we described the design process is that inevitably the clients that we would have would come from different areas, some from Pasadena in that world, and some from out of this world. And uh, we never tried to press them but they would eventually kind of drift to one of the partners or the other. But actually, we never designed it as only one person. Uh, very often, once we got rid of all the draftsmen, all the draftsmen, three, I think, or something, but uh, the people working with us, we'd sit around a big table and mix a jug of martinis and discuss the job, and something would happen that some way, collectively, we would arrive at a conclusion or a direction. And we would generally try to amongst ourselves point who was going to be the spokesman for the group and carry on. But uh, I don't think that there are very many jobs, a lower couple, that you could say, yes, Don did that, or Cal did that, or Conrad did that. They were things that we all worked on together. And I know that that denies the old rumor about, um, what is it, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. But we didn't design by committees. We designed by mutual affection. I can put it that way, and mutual respect. And so we had a good time. And we did a lot of things, and we learned a great number of things. It was good. The other thing that happened to me today, besides seeing Don, is I looked over in Ray's office and saw two charming young people. And uh, they used to be younger than I am, so I call them young people. And one of them was a student of ours last year at Arizona State. And I'm delighted to see him over here working with Mr. Kaplan. And is it Denise that my pronounce? Tracy. Tracy, Tracy. I don't know where I got Denise. It's a nice name too, but Tracy also. <laughs> Tracy comes from Texas. And when I went to school at Texas A&M, that was the arch enemy of the University of Texas. I used to fight all the time. And then, of course, I had a very special treat besides seeing Shelley. Uh, Ray took me on a tour today. And uh, I don't know if you know Mr. Cappy's own house, but uh, and I don't flatter him. He's, too old to be flattered, and uh, maybe not old enough, I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, wonderful house, and delightful to stay there as a guest. And then we went out and saw things under construction. And I feel a little like a country boy these days, living in Arizona, because we see these, we drove up to houses, oh my God, you know, fantastic houses, great spaces, and they, we, we don't get too many of those over in the bushes in Arizona. But then we saw some great houses, there were some nice little houses. And then what was really interesting to me was uh, I saw a couple of my houses, which I was flattered to see that were still standing up there. But uh, one of them and the other we visited, and uh, it was really kind of a thrill. I'm going to tell you a few stories like this. Maybe it's not terribly academic, but uh, 1953, I was very young and tender, and uh, as an architect, and, had a little office over in school, wedged between two stairways. And one day a lady came in, and 
She was absolutely in love with lady. Her name was Olga, and she loved, was lovely because she liked my work. She'd seen a couple of little houses we'd done. And uh, she was very warm and friendly and fine. And she said, want to show me your property. Well, we drove down this way. I don't know what the name of it is, down there in the ranches. Uplifter or something like that. He went down this marvelous road. Here was about a 10-acre site with a stream going through it, with huge big oak trees and everything. And I just died on the spot. I wanted to do a house on that site so much I couldn't even see straight. So all and I had a surreptitious love affair for a short while until she said, now it's time to meet my husband. And uh, her husband arrived one day at the office and Milton came in and Milton was obviously a very shrewd businessman. I could smell it my way. He knew what he was talking about. We had a conversation and he said, tell me how you work. I told him, it's my fee as this, this pause for a while, he said, it's kind of a heavy fee for a young man like you. And uh, I said, no, I'm scared of that. And uh, I said, I think I'm worth it, and I really will show you How about that. I, he kind of, he couldn't get off base. And I finally said, Mr. Farbsy, I strongly suggest that you're a very capable businessman. No far more than I do. I'm a good architect. I think we can do a good job together. Would you cut all this silliness out? And he kind of laughed and chuckled. I thought he was going to walk out the door. And he said, okay, okay. He said, but you'll throw the blueprints in for free, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a little extra hundred buck charge. I said, uh-uh. He said, okay. And we had a great relationship. And we met him today. I haven't seen him for 35 years. He has a beautiful garden. He's retired. And uh, he had some nice things to say about him what the house had meant to their family. And it made a lot of things very much wild. And this is maybe the thing that's rather wonderful about being an architect and living through a certain period of time. We all have an amazing collection of clients. Some of them are real monsters. But the majority of them we've had, fortunately, have been great people. And they're very closest friends I have. And I go visit them whenever I get a chance and see them in town. Every now and then I'll bump into somebody at a show or something and uh, makes you feel great. You say, I live in one of your houses. I can't even remember the house it's been so long ago. Then finally it comes back. But uh, all that feels good. And so why I mention that is that what are these things that I'm talking about? I'm talking about the real rewards to architects in practice. They make a good living too, don't worry. And they pay good fees too, don't worry. And I very happily can say that in Forty some odd years, I've never been in any legal action. No one has ever defaulted on a fee. And I think that that, partially, I really believe, comes from the fact that I feel that our clients are our associates. Of them. They really work with us for good clients. And it's not a case of saying, what do you want, and cranking it up. It's finding out how to do it and how it is that they can do it themselves. So the question of, you know, I'm sure you've read lots of pretty fancy things in the magazines. I see a divine line of cosmic relationships of myopic visions and something like that. I read all this stuff and I think, what the hell is he talking about? And uh, all this kind of mumbo jumbo that you will find in architectural magazines. And uh, I really think it's not that complicated. I think there are people like you and I, I think architects who are good, have sensitivity to needs. And I think that they can see things clearly and if they're really good architects, they can do the job for that client at that moment in time. And they become the client in a way at that time. And that doesn't mean that we lose our ego, that we've all got good juice ones. It's good to have an ego. But not let it get in the way of doing your job. And I think to be able to do all of this together with a good client makes it a marvelous thing. And I know, Don, we all have certain clients that Say, what did you hear about so and so? Actually, she's up in Santa Barbara, they're in the good life, or something like that. But uh, we keep track of them, and it's wonderful when we hear from them after. So that's what makes it good. What about what happened in this period right after the war? And uh, I didn't check my times, Shelley. You kind of give me some signals with you when I wish you could. I go fast on this issue. But the excitement of what happened is that many of us were all coming kind of out of school. 
Many of us were coming out of the service. Many of us had been overseas. We were delighted to be out of the war. We were sick of the war. Many of us were married. We were ready to begin our lives. And all the young architects I knew were ready to begin their profession. And no, we hadn't done anything. It hadn't been just for the time of the war, but something very interesting that people forget. And back in 1929, remember something happened, which was the Depression and the crime. There was no architecture for all those people from 29 on, practically. I say no, but no one really know. And I you know I had an instructor who graduated from Harvard, taught at Pasadena College. Poor guy got out of Harvard right in the middle of the Depression. He was a pretty capable guy. No work, nothing, nothing. Taught in a junior college. And uh, I appreciate the fact that he did. Because although I didn't like him, he told me I'd never be an architect. And we used to fight all the time. But he was a good teacher too at the same time. So, but all those people kind of came through and for that whole period from 29 to 1946, architecture was almost zero. One or two houses by Richard Neutra, one or two houses by Harold Harris. I'm sure Shelley has introduced you to some of these people that we really thought were gods because they were building little houses. And a little house was something sensational to build at that time. And we would all go out and study and look at them and think about it. But nothing really happened until right after the war. In about 46, 47, they dumped us all back in the United States Half of them, I think, came to California. And everybody wanted to live in California. And you know what's happened, of course. <laughs> and the trouble is there were no homes, there were no houses, and everything had to get turned upside down. And there was a tremendous need for housing. And of course, that's when those rows and rows and rows of ugly, ticky-tacky tract houses were built because people had to have places to live. And most of the young architects of our age looked around and said, that's no good. Not that we really knew the answer, but we said we think there must be a better answer. And we kind of knew what a philosophy of living could be. And you know, things like sitting outdoors in your patio really weren't around at that time. Those tract houses, you didn't live outdoors. You didn't have natural material. You didn't really integrate with landscape. Uh, women's place was in the home before the war, but after the war, most of them were in the factories or working. My wife worked at Caltech, and I think she had to learn how to kind of take care of me and keep working too later on. But it was a whole change about it. And it was an exciting time because the things were changing. Remember that old repeat somebody's song, the times are changing? But I've always remembered that because you could sense this going on. And the world was changing, and so people died, started dying in. So out of that period began this whole program, and of course Shelley and I think has told you, or will tell you more about it, this case study program. But the school at USC, and here we were, and I frankly was just learning, kids came back and we were all really quite close friends and very personal. And no one really got uptight about who was the professor and who was the student, because we all had to kind of learn something. And everyone worked at it. And I think we did learn things. And we went into areas that we were concerned about housing. We were concerned about social housing. One of my greatest pets, and we used to drive the students crazy, was housing for migratory workers. And I still think it's a major problem, just like housing for low-income people. But uh, anyway, all of this was going on. And in the process, we started to build a few things. And most of us hadn't done too much work. And we got a little job. I think my first tiny house, and, my wife and I built was 16 feet by 24 feet. We built it with our own hands. It cost us $500. And my first child was born there. We had to add a wing. I think that was eight feet deep. <laughs> so we keep getting her out of the kitchen. So to speak. But uh, all of that was our learning process. And then we built houses for each other. Then we built them for some friends. And then somebody saw something and said, hey, I like it. And uh, we built another one. And then somebody said, I like that. And before we know it, we were in business. And uh, we really didn't mean to get in business. We just got in business kind of because that was our business on the side, so to speak. You know, we didn't say, let's plan this out. Let's get a cost consultant. Let's get a secretary and all that. 
We just charge for it. So this is what it's all about, and I thought I'd show you a few of these slides. Uh, I mentioned that this movement in this early phase went on from the period of about 47, 48. I think my oldest living student came in with me recently. I think he was 47, a graduate or something in that period. But uh, we all, there are a whole group of people from Southern Cal, and of course I realize I'm in the den of iniquity over here in UCLA, but uh, we really weren't competitive with UCLA, except for painting Tommy Georgia. Treasury. But the Berkeley School was still going, and in transition and happening, and architecture had been evolving in California, and although a lot of people have a feeling that modern architecture didn't come to California until after the war, until after World War II. I take great exception because I believe that it had been coming along strongly for the previous almost 100 years. And it began really in California. You remember the gold mining days? All the thousands of people had rushed out. And where were they going to stay? And they had to build houses. And this is very good. This is up in Telluride, where I like to ski in Colorado. This is two before frame construction. And they threw the cities up overnight. And this was the beginning of what I call modern Western architecture. It doesn't look terribly modern, but it was revolutionary in terms of construction. No one had ever put two befores together that you could hold in one hand, lift up and hammer at the same time. So we built light skeleton frame. So this was the beginning, in a sense, of architecture. We reached some kind of really flamboyant stages. I'm sure we've all seen the Gothic and Victorian Gothic, or Carpenter's Gothic, we call it. It got more and more elaborate, the jigsaws and things. But the real, real early California house was a ranch house. And if you've ever been out and seen some of the great adobes, some of those nice ranch houses, I think that was really, to be honest, the beginning of modern architecture in California. Other people disagree. I think along the line, we suddenly have a series of influences that are so meaningful. I grew up in this little town of Pasadena with the little old ladies and, you know, and all those stories about it. It was really true. And I used to take students out to this place because I didn't know who had done it. Had done it. But it was a house in Orange Grove, up Orange Grove. And I loved it. And uh, I took a bus load of students out one day. And uh, there's windows up there over the front entrance. One of them opened and this little old lady stuck her head out white hair and said, what are you looking at, gentlemen? And I said, we are admiring your house, ma'am. And she said, would you like to see it? Yes. <laughs> and we all piled in. This is a very great, wonderful Campbell house. This is a masterpiece of American craftsman architecture, one of the national finest houses in the nation's history. And the whole house is a jewel. It's an absolute jewel. And uh, we didn't know what it was. That time we were just getting a feeling of understanding of what this historic development had been. We had the feel of it. And it was a house that lived in the sun, had sleeping porches, warm and natural, responded to some of the philosophy of John Muir, certainly responded to the philosophy of William Morris, Stickley, Gustav Stickley. And we had a wonderful sight. You can see the huge oak trees and gardens. And we just lifted all the plants up, tied the branches, and build underneath the branches and let them sit down and it looked like it had been there for years. And uh, it's still a very favorite house of ours. And these people have lived in, they had a wonderful series of celebrations a couple of years ago for the 35th anniversary. And parties and friends and architects, we all had a grand time, toasting a good time to get. But these were typical of the houses and you can see there's a little influence from Japan we always had some influence in California from the Orient, and uh, I don't deny it. I think that things are beautiful. We didn't try to make Japanese houses, but we felt that that was part of our legitimate influence. We even felt very strongly about bedrooms that had outdoor sleeping places. And I always used to plant a night blooming jasmine outside the door. It smells sexy at night, and uh, people like that. But these were all places that I'm trying to stress the idea and I think they were human places, and sometimes good, sometimes not so good. There's a house up on the side of the Arroyo in Pasadena, and sometimes we had a hard time getting onto these sites. This was a 
were very nice client of ours, and we worked for many years in different project. But you can see it was a very steep hillside, and we brought the entrance to the garden. And notice that most of our gardens we did ourselves, although occasionally we worked with landscape people, because we believed that the gardens were an integral part of the whole space. And this moved up to a series of outdoor courtyards, and you came in on an upper level and threw flowers and pools, and uh, suddenly, when you came through, the house was on the far side of the Royal Seacoat, looking down at the Rose Bowl. Absolutely gorgeous view out of the cold side of the mountain. Great trees. It was so steep we had to rope ourselves on it to kind of measure it and look at it and see what it was like. And uh, we saved every tree, which we thought was a major victory. And it was kind of a nice house. I think it cost about $40,000 at that time, which to us was astronomical. But today, you can imagine what they go for. And uh, again, part of our philosophy was not only this, but the landscape, and the site, and everything to do with the whole thing. The building didn't stop at the walls. The building didn't stop until you reached the property line. And then it didn't stop if there was something important to see beyond that point. So the privacy was respected, but the space flowed. And uh, so this one was coming down and moving through, and we've had a lot of fun with it. It's been restored. The owners recently went through a great restoration, and it looks better than it did when it was new. And they brought some 35 or so years, kind of erased it, put in new sort of dark bronze uh, hardware on the windows instead of that old shiny aluminum that we all hated. But that's all we had in those times. Replace it with things like that. The other people, this is even to show, this is back underneath the garage and the kitchen. And we even had a place out of the kitchen area for the people that worked in the house. They were obviously fairly wealthy people. I only have two pictures of my most important job, my first house. My wife and I and good friend Emmett Wimple built it one summer. We found a lot, paid $1,500 for it. The guy financed us and for $8,000 we built our first house. My wife laid all the brick floors, him and I did all the carpentry and painting, and it made fun. You can see it's very simple, but it was kind of a meaningful house. We got all of our furniture from Cost Plus and used War Surplus, and I had a grand time living it, but it was a good life, and it was a meaningful house. One of the ones that was very meaningful in terms of public relations, but we never got a job off of it, I don't believe to it. It was a case study house. For Saw Bass, and this was, they had been published in eight different countries in different parts of the world, and I don't think we ever got a job from it. But we had a grand, grand time doing it. And this was a very experimental house. You can see it was all done, built in a factory. The beams were all hollow plywood. The vaults were all shells of plywood. And we built a lot of these ourselves. You can see it was a modular house, and it was designed to bring the cost down. Uh, I don't think it did in our case we could, until that's the fact that plywood people help subsidize it. But it was an interesting house to us because it was very spatial, very open, lots of things there. Mr. Bass, you probably don't know, but probably one of the greatest graphic designers in the world. And we had a grand time with working with him. He used to do all the movies like uh, Grand Prix and the titles and all those things. So very creative. And here was this house, quite different from those other houses, you can see. Very experimental. I think the grass cracked on that one. And laboratories and kitchens. A lot of little houses go very quickly. Clients would come to us and they didn't have much money. And this was one we called Little Thompson. And it was on the side of a cliff, practically. You can see how steep it was. And they were great people. And I forget how much we built it for, but very little bit of money. They did a lot of the work themselves. And I think we won a first honor award for Sunset for that year. But it was a family house of ours. It was like a big box guy up in the trees. And the kitchen, you can see, was two stories high. And uh, somebody said, why the hell do you need a two-story high kitchen? And you don't really accept that all those bedrooms up above looked out over beyond it. And that little kitchen felt huge and grand and gorgeous. And the house was 1,400 square feet. Tiny house, but it felt good. Then, in contrast, a house for a very wealthy man in Beverly Hills, in some 
5,000 square feet with one bedroom. And uh, he moved out of a 74 room Georgian house. And so we were doing houses for poor people and rich people. And that may sound funny to you, but it was exciting to us because they were all people with different kinds of needs. This gentleman had a great fondness for Mexican architecture, but he didn't want a Mexican house. And so what we were trying to do was evoke the feeling of a courtyard and the architecture and the feeling without doing it literally. Even the kitchen had a sort of a sloppy tile top on it. So people thought it was kind of funny. But they had a good time. Now there was a typical house in Beverly Hills up on the lake. I think Don was very strongly involved with this one. I'm not sure if we have the same slides or not, Don. But Duffy Edwards' house, and they were delightful people. And typical bench and very tight site in Beverly Hills, which still cost an awful lot of money. But perhaps you can see one of the main things that we were thinking about was the idea of space, <coughs> that the whole thing flowed. And you weren't confined and boxed into little rooms. And uh, these were not really terribly expensive houses. They were competitive. This was a pretty fancy bathroom because this was a kid. His fourth and fifth marriage, he said, make it exotic for me. And we get a fabulous bathroom for okay. me. Anyway, this is another house, which is the Mosley House now. It was built for Dr. Thompson. And it's recently been all restored. And you can see how buried in the bushes it was. We just built it tight in all directions. Lovely people and great lighting and wonderful furniture by Sam Maloof. Sam would get a lot of the furniture from these houses. And he was one of the great craftsmen, probably in California, if not in the world. So many of these are similar. And this house is much more handsome today than it was five years ago. Because it's been done and these other people have restored it and brought it back to life. All houses need to kind of be taken care of. The last big house we did when I left California was a house for a young couple, 26 years old. And it's kind of big. I think it had 14,000 square feet in it. And, uh, but it was the last of kind of what I call the California houses that I was involved in. Basically wood and many wings, and, but much more sophisticated in some respects than others. And you can still see the kind of relationship that existed between the interior and the exterior, the spaces. Only here we had a chance to kind of use first class materials in every direction. So we don't do that all the time. Moved to Arizona personally, a whole new world over there. We had to take a new look because you don't use wood and you don't build the same in the Arizona desert. This was typical of what I call stone post and beam. But we built a house out of stone from the site because the owners wanted it. And, uh, Kind of interesting because these very large piers carried the structure. The structure was just like an awning, and then these big piers served as solar screens to keep the morning sun from coming in the windows. And they're all for free. There's no veneer or phoniness there. They had a little mason who was about 68 years old, and he built them all himself. Beautiful job. And this is a small house recently just finished, and it's for a Canadian doctor who's moved to Phoenix. And it's on a cul-de-sac street. You know what those are? Nothing street. With dingbat houses all around. And, uh, and no view, no nothing. So all we could do was wall the whole house in. And the whole house is walled in around the courtyard, patios, and the screen grill, and practically blight to the street. There's another one. One other thing, somebody said, well, where's all that lovely wood you used to use? We don't use it here or something just all goes to pieces on it when it's exposed. And so you have to find another method of building with which. So all of that's fun. And uh, you go through all kinds of different things and you wind up with a few dog houses and a few nice ones. But uh, I think if I haven't gone too far or about right, you want to take a break? Uh, we, I suggested to Don that perhaps after we go through a little while that he and I join up here. If there's anything we can discuss, I don't mean question and answer per se, but anything you'd like to talk about. Somebody always wants to talk about, and I do too. How come you only work for rich people? Yeah. And that's a really good question. It's not an easy one to answer. Because we haven't found too many committees to hire us to work for poor people, even though we've tried very hard. A lot of us. 
What's your pleasure, sir? Shall we break? Good. Take a short break, I guess, with everyone. Better step outside. school, he and uh, his good friend, Conrad Buck, um, before they graduated, designed attractive houses in uh, Lakewood. So they really got an early start. They continued to uh, work together until uh, 1955 when they joined forces with Calvin Straub, forming the firm of Buck, Straub, and Hensman. And as they say, the rest is history. So after having seen some of the early work, uh, Don Hensman is now going to show you uh, how the work evolved uh, from the early 60s. And we're delighted to welcome you here to the podium, Don Hensman. Thank you. 